Welcome. Uh, my name is Nancy Peluso, and um, I'm going to be presiding over our uh, proceedings today, uh, this celebration of the life of Nathaniel Gerhardt. Um, before we start, uh, just a little reminder, if you have a cell phone, could you please turn it off? Um, there's already been a memorial, as some of you know, uh, in New York City for uh, Nathaniel that was held uh, by the family about uh, a week after the accident. And, um, but we wanted to do something specifically with the Berkeley community um, and other people from the West Coast and, and elsewhere, maybe who couldn't make it to the New York ceremonies. And um, so that, that's what we're going to do today. Um, we're going to start out with uh, three people speaking. Um, uh, I'm sorry, we've already got a problem with the program. Somebody's not on it. But um, uh, anyway, uh, you can understand that we've been, we've been working on this uh, up, to, up to the last minute, and just we made a mistake. Sorry. But um, Leslie Gerhardt, Nathaniel's sister, will be speaking first. And then um, Karen Levy, who's a very good friend, a uh, colleague and uh, a good friend of both Amanda and Nathaniel will be reading something that was written by Nathaniel's partner uh, for Nathaniel. And um, then Matt Gerhardt, his cousin, uh, will be coming up and speaking. And that will be followed by um, a, sh a short slideshow of some uh, photo memories of Nathaniel. So um, Leslie, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. That was really nice. Um, so I'm Leslie. I'm Nathaniel's sister. And I wanted to thank you all for coming here today to celebrate um, to celebrate the life and times of Nathaniel Gerhardt. Um, we come here today to share our loss together and to remember Nathaniel. And it's so unfortunate that I have to meet so many of you at this time. <laughs> There's no good time to meet people like this, but I would have much preferred to meet you all at his dissertation defense or at his graduation or at some Frisbee game. I would have preferred to meet you at a happy occasion instead. But you are the Berkeley people who Nathaniel had met in the past few years and who he cared so much about. And I know that he had looked forward to becoming colleagues and friends with all of you for the rest of his life. Most of you have met Nathaniel relatively recently. And by the time he came here to Berkeley, he had already sort of sorted out a direction for some things. And he'd already developed certain characteristic traits, which you all know him for. But I wanted to give you a little bit of background things about Nathaniel that you you might not know about him. Um, for example, you might you might know that Nathaniel was very, very well traveled and he had a lot of experience living overseas in Peru and in Indonesia. But you might not know that Nathaniel was born in Botswana and that we had already lived in three different countries in Botswana and Kenya and Egypt before we moved to the U.S. when Nat was 10 years old. So he has a long travel record that goes way back before he came here. You might know that Nathaniel had a gift for learning languages and that he had studied Latin very seriously in high school for many years before he moved on to Spanish and Bahasa. But you might not know that this gift for languages started at a very, very young age. And when we were little kids, my brother and I had our own made-up language. It was called Wiggy. <laughs> and we only spoke it to each other. And grown-ups weren't allowed to speak the language. And the grown-ups weren't allowed to go to Wiggy Land, where they speak Wiggy. And um, Wiggy Land, just in case you need to know, is located at the back of my mother's walk-in closet. Um, <laughs> so we spent the good first five, six years of our lives together at, at Wiggy Land, speaking fluent Wiggy. Um, and of course, you don't need a visa or any research permits to go to Wiggy Land. You all know that Nathana was a fanatic about bird watching. 
but you might not know that he got this from his father, my dad, at a really, really young age. There's a great story about Nathaniel when we were living in Nairobi. He was about three years old, and he was a very, very small three-year-old. He was about this big. And we were on the lawn at my parents' house in Nairobi, and we had a house guest um, who was there for lunch one afternoon, and Nathaniel was out on the lawn, and there was a bird there. And this lovely house guest said to Nathaniel, Oh, look, Nathaniel, there's a birdie. And Nathaniel characteristically looked at the bird and then looked at the house guest and very matter-of-factly with a certain tone said, oh, pff, that, that is a Reichenau's warbler. <laughs> Age three, I swear. <laughs> and you all know that Nathaniel was a very compassionate and sensitive person who cared very deeply about the things that meant the most to him. But you might not know that this caring and nurturing quality started very, very early on when he first asked me to repair his favorite stuffed animal, Rhino. And Rhino had sprung a lot of holes, and Rhino's stuffing was coming out. Rhino was falling apart at the seams, and Nathaniel had had Rhino since he was born, a little blue stuffed animal. And we carefully sewed Rhino back together again, and we very carefully patched all the holes that Rhino had so that Rhino could continue to travel with Nathaniel all over the world, including most recently to Indonesia. Rhino's now with Amanda back in Indonesia in East Kalimantan. So Rhino's done pretty well with all that nurturing. Obviously, I could go on and on about Nathaniel and about how much we miss him. We miss him now. And we will continue to miss him and remember him in the future. But for now, we must care for each other in our grieving. And our hearts go out to my mother, Gail, who's in New York, and to Amanda, who's in Indonesia, and to my cousins, who are all here today, Matt, Andy, and Alice. And I know that we will each find our own way of living very richly in the way that Nathaniel would have admired, and in continuing the work that Nathaniel had started, but unfortunately didn't have enough time to finish. Thanks very much. Karen's going to read something that Amanda wrote. So Amanda, as you all know, is in Indonesia right now on a pretty difficult journey. Uh, to go back to where they had been living and go get rhino and other belongings. Um, she asked me to read this on her behalf. She said, I'm sorry I can't be here with you today. I just want to remind you of what you already know, but maybe need me to tell you again on behalf of Nathaniel. Many of you have been his family in the best and the most difficult times of his life. He made several choices during his time in Berkeley leaving to be with his father, and then le later leaving to be with me and to carry out his research. These were times that were bittersweet because it became clear to him both what he had and also what he was leaving behind. I want to tell you that he took all of you with him wherever he went, and that your friendship and community gave him strength and joy, which he always carried with him. I send love to you all on Nathaniel's behalf. Hi, I'm, uh, I'm Matt, Nat's cousin, and I know many of you from Berkeley myself. Um, I'm really glad that we're able to put this together here for us on the West Coast. Uh, I know many of you couldn't travel, and it's, it's just special to be here. Again, seeing a lot of faces that I haven't seen for many years. Um, this is a shirt that Nat gave me. He, he got it in Mexico on one of his trips. I, th I think many of you have trinkets and things that he, he brought back. He was very good at that. Um, I got to wear this at my wedding rehearsal, which was nice. Um, along the lines of Leslie, I wanted to kind of preface a lot of what many of you, uh, the other speakers, are going to say, people who've known Nat uh, more in the academic, intellectual sense, um, and I'm sure are going to comment on his intellect and achievements. Uh, I just wanted to tell a little bit about how I got to know some of these qualities at, at a much earlier age um, through a few stories. 
Uh, most recently, Nat's passion for adventure and, and his passion for community. We, uh, actually all of the cousins and I, we were lucky enough to go visit Nathaniel when he was in Peru working um, yeah, to do in an ecotourism venture, working with the local community and flew into Cusco and he actually came to meet us. And most people then go to where he was, where Manu National Park, by, by an airplane and land in a sort of grassy field, bumpy venture. But Nathaniel decided that it would be more fun if we got in the back of a camion, a large sort of cargo truck, and bounced down a road for two and a half days <laughs> in rutted, you know, treacherous conditions, um, and, which we all thought was a great idea. And that, <laughs> That was sort of his way of showing us this journey that it really took to see how far he was and to see you know, the trip from the Andes down all the way to the rainforest through cloud forest. Follow that with a day on a, on, you know, on, on a dugout canoe to get to this place. Um, that was for us, but it was really also for his community because he needed to organize a way to get a lot of his community, the Machigangas, down to their home. He also had the, we, we traveled with them um, we tried to communicate with them. We, we brought a lot of supplies down as well, so that was typical of him. Um, secondly, his, his drive and competitiveness. I'm sure some of you will touch on this. You know, he was a, a very uh, accomplished Frisbee player. Um, primarily, earlier in life, uh, Nathaniel and my brother Andy and, and I would make up lots of games, lots of competitions. <laughs> And this ranged from skipping rocks to bouncing balls to, most importantly, soccer. And uh, because we've all played that. And these were truly terrible battles, I have to tell you. Um, one of the games that I'm remembering was a three-way soccer match where you know everyone played in the hallway, in the entryway to a house, and with different doorways as goals. And you got to score when you, when, when you scored, you got points. But when you got scored on, you lost points, which we thought was a very was a genius in terms of the development of sports <laughs> until we realized that what it means is that when somebody's close to winning, then you just gang up on them and you knock them down and you keep them from winning. So this still worked for us because it meant we played for hours and hours and hours and nobody could win and we couldn't stop. And I re distinctly remember one of my favorite memories of Nat is him kind of beating Andy into a corner and knocking a lamp over at 3 a.m. and everyone's trying to sleep in this house. Um, it was Leslie's, Leslie's foyer, actually, <laughs> trying to sleep. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to touch on, on Nat's pure joy of just being together with people. He, he was actually the reason that I, he was the cause of my first all-nighter. Um, he came to visit our family in Colorado when he was probably about 14 or 15, w along with folks. And we were just so excited. We didn't get to see, as Leslie mentioned, you know, they lived all over the world, so we didn't get to see each other much. We were very excited to be together. Just stayed up talking, you know, playing. It was, again, two or three in the morning um, when Nat suggested we just stay up and watch the sunrise. And, and so we did. And it was quite beautiful. So um, I just wanted to mention those were some of Nat's gifts, and I, I'm very excited to have the chance to hear from some of you some of the gifts that I know he gave to each of us. Of 
divided up the money But the drummer could not stay He said he's gonna meet us later At the Dream Cafe When you turn from the window And you won't not slip Put your eyes to my fingers While the ceiling dripped <laughs> I just could not believe you I heard a motorcycle pull away Yes, I'll meet you after midnight At the Dream Cafe Flowers now on Lynn Street And a new moon just above They tore down all the houses Where we used to make love But they'd been long abandoned When we went there anyway And I can still smell the lilacs In the corner of the dream cafe Fighting ten years Do you really have to go? Couldn't you reconsider Do it real, real slow I like living with you I don't care what you say I don't care who you meet At the Dream Cafe Lost in a fantasy I heard you cry out someone's name And maybe it was me But later as we walk You seem so far away Am I the man you thought you met At the Dream Cafe down with the sickness I thought you were the cure But passion seems to promise more than friendship can endure You spelled it out in black and white My eyes saw shades of gray And so I said Um, the next three speakers are people who lived with Nathaniel while he was a graduate student here uh, at Berkeley. Um, the first is Sam England, who was a housemate at what was known as the Edgecroft House during uh, Nathaniel's second year of graduate school. And um, they both have a history in Egypt. I'll let, you tell him, I'll let him tell you about that. Uh, the second speaker will be Letty Brown, who is also an ESPM student. She also plays Frisbee and, and was also a roommate at the Edgecroft House. And the third will be um, Matthew Curtis, a housemate in the McGee House. And they went to a lot of costume parties together. <laughs> and following the speakers, we'll have uh, Ryan Green Roussel and Rebecca Sanders, who will be singing I'll Fly Away. Thanks. So um, it's true that I, I know Nathaniel um, 
from a sort of theoretical version of Egypt. We never actually met, but we went to elementary school together there. Um, and one day, uh, when I had gone back, a number of times I'd gone back to Egypt, um, and my mom was working at the American University in Cairo, and pretty much becoming convinced day by day that she loved the Gerhardt family, even the members of it that she had never met. Um, I went to a faculty party um, a, for a, a retiring faculty member, and I met uh, Gail and John, and um, they were very sweetly asking me what I was going to do with my life, and I said, well, I'm going to go to grad school at Berkeley. They said, oh, we've got a son at Berkeley. I said, oh, really? And they said, yeah, he lives in a beautiful house. And I said, I want to live in a beautiful house in Berkeley. <laughs> And the next thing I knew, I was emailing Gail, and she put me in touch with Nathaniel. And then I was involved in these uh, long-distance conference calls, uh, pleading um, with these poor four people um, to let me live in their house. And um, they ended up saying yes. Um, so I think you could say, you definitely could say that Nathaniel was my first uh, friend here at, at Berkeley. And in fact, all those years before, uh, we found out that we had been playing in the same soccer league back in Egypt and that we had the same patches from our baseball team and things somewhere in our attics. There's very little I could say about Nathaniel that would not overlap with what everyone else has said or is about to say so eloquently. Uh, I, I tuned in and, and I watched his memorial in New York and was struck not only um, by what I already knew about Nathaniel that people were saying about him and his wonderful qualities, but also so much that I, I learned about him and how relatively late in his life I, I, I met him and how much there was of him to get to know. And that Nathaniel that people were talking about, his friends from, from grade school, his friends from New York, his family, I knew that Nathaniel, and I, I feel as if I, I know him even better from those stories. But I like to think that of all the things that he was and all the things that he, he did with such remarkable passion, there was a side to Nathaniel that I always felt was somehow special to our friendship. And that, that side came out when we were doing nothing but just joking around. Now, I've asked myself more than once if this was the time and the place to talk about his lighter moments. And again and again, as I've reminisced over the time of Nathaniel's life, that I had the privilege of knowing him, I've realized that it was his sense of humor where I felt most apart. And that without either of us mentioning it or even being aware of it, we were building something, a set of stories that were silly and absurd and unrelated, and yet they fit together perfectly. It was as if we were writing a, a shared language. And Nathaniel, as we know, uh, was a, a true philologist. And he was a philologist in the old Greek sense of the term, that he just loved language. And this is something I've had with very few people. And I hope that I can honor his memory with a couple anecdotes. He relished the joke with his whole self. His wit crackled with energy and just smarts. Everything was thought out. He had an eye for detail that a novelist would envy. Maybe it had to do with his life of bird watching. Maybe it had to, maybe it had to do with everything he did. It was the way he played frisbee, the way he lived in a communal house. It was the way he did research. Joking highlighted his remarkable analytical powers and his gift for words in a way that was never self-aggrandizing. As with all of Nathaniel's favorite pastimes, this was a chance to collaborate. Humor was a team sport. Case in point, there is a wonderful man who used to take us uh, on behalf of the university, the American University in Cairo, and he would pick us up from the airport and he was really good at taking me and my mom from the airport. But there was nothing like him picking up the Gerhards from the airport, <laughs> picking up the president of the university and his family. And this is a guy 
who is probably around 70 years old now. And he's been working at this university for as long as I can remember. His name is Abdel Messiah. And he has been there for my family and for the Gerhards for a long time. And at times when my mom was pretty sure that I wouldn't show up, um, that my plane had been hijacked because it was 17 hours late. These were in the TWA years. <laughs> so there's this guy, Abdel Masih. And another very close friend, um, even closer to, to the Gerhards, um, is a woman named Rueda, who some of us know here, um, who worked for Nathaniel's dad. Uh, in the office at AUC, the American University. Um, and then there's another rather elderly member of the American University, a guy by the name of Saadidin Ibrahim, who has become very well known. And at one point, I said to Nathaniel, hey, Nathaniel, you want to see what it looks like when Saadidin Ibrahim comes to a, a, a conference? And he said, yeah. And so I went like this. <laughs> and Nathaniel was about the most fantastic audience member you could have, and especially if you're a ham like me. And somehow uh, Nathaniel decided, and he took me aside one day when we were at a conference uh, for the Middle East Studies Association, and he came up to me the, the, the way he would at, with these sort of furtive asides, and he said, you know about the AUC basketball team, right? And I'm thinking about gangly Egyptian kids who are about 19 years old. And he said, no, 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 no. He says, OK. So Sadadin Ibrahim pushes the ball up. <laughs> and he passes it off to Ruwaida. And he says, and Abdel Messiah, this is the airport guy, he is so money. He is so money that the way we would describe him was when he got you from that airport and through this incredible bureaucracy, not only would he take you, he, it, was this, it was as if he dunked the ball, and then he hung off the rim for a while. <laughs> so he gets the pass, and he flies in, and he's just hanging off the rim like, ah! I would like to take credit for that, but that was Nathaniel. Shortly after I, I moved in here in Berkeley and house with, with uh, uh, Nathaniel and Letty um, and Beth Rose and Kate. I had a, a really interesting getting to know you experience with Nathaniel. Um, but he was wearing women's clothes. Um, so this was for Halloween. And he and Deanna dressed up together as, uh, I think this is called a candy girl, who walks around with a tray full of cigarettes and candy and things. And we walked through the Castro that day, that night. Um, and as you know, it, it gets very, very crowded there. And we were, we were going one by one, following through an, a, an area on the street. And Deanna walks by, and there's this guy, this guy we don't know, as he sees her pass by. And he's, you know, Nathaniel's been passing out candy all night, and people are trying to figure out, is this, is this a man? Is this a woman? I mean, he looked good. He looked really good. <laughs> and as, he, as Deanna passes by, there's this guy, and he looks like he might reach for her, or he's got something, he's got something kind of rude to say. And as he passes by, Nathaniel spins around, I mean, spins around, and says, hey! And he stops him. <laughs> and that night, Nathaniel had bought a Polaroid. Uh, he, he had gotten a guy to take a Polaroid shot of us. And it was this brilliant shot. I, I, I don't know where it is now of, of him all done up with the makeup. And he's got this special shiny velour that he's put on his mini skirt. I mean, he looked incredible. But I would gladly trade that for a Polaroid shot of that guy's face <laughs> as he turned around and saw Nathaniel in drag stop him <laughs> mid harassment. <laughs> OK. The last one, of course, is probably my favorite. Um, and this is a story that Nathaniel told to me, telling me about uh, getting a slice of pizza at R&L's Pizza just down the hill from here. So he loved it. It was New York pizza. And he would grab a slice just before he got on the number seven bus that would take us up to, to the, the house we lived in. And the way he tells me this story, he says, oh, you know me. I'm a guy who I got to put a lot of oregano on my pizza when I eat it. I thought, OK. OK, where's the story going? And he says, so I just wolf down this piece of pizza, and then I try to get on the bus as quickly as I can. It's going by. I barely have enough time to just get it in my mouth. And he says, and that lady's on the bus. And I immediately knew 
who he was talking about. Um, this is a lady who rides the bus with a lot of, of baggage, both physical and, 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 and psychic. And he, he says, um, he says I, I get on the bus, and I'm sitting in the front. And he says, and I've still got all this oregano there. <laughs> and I've got this, you know, this pizza I'm finishing off. So I'm going, minding my own business, just looking straight ahead. And he said, and I suddenly I hear from behind me, what you doing with your mouth, weirdo? <laughs> and it tells me so much about his incredible good nature and good humor that Nathaniel liked that story. <laughs> And the way he described this woman, this rather eccentric person, was he said to me, you know, those things that you want to say, but you can't make yourself say, she says them. <laughs> so in the past few weeks, I, I've been thinking a lot about the things I wanted to say. And what I would like to say about this Nathaniel, the wit and pundit and social theorist and friend the one who joked with the same generosity of spirit he brought to everything and to everyone in his life. The one who would just call me up, and as soon as I answered, I'd hear on the other line, doggy, <laughs> what's up? That was my Nathaniel. And if I may say so, that was our Nathaniel. I was the Letinator. <laughs> that was my name. <laughs> uh, so my name's Letty, and I had the pleasure of living with Nathaniel for his first two years of graduate school. We just heard a little bit about the house, the Edgecroft house. When we first met, uh, I was interviewing Nathaniel along with my other housemates to see if he would be a good fit and he was standing on a Berkeley street wearing Tiva's quick dry shorts and shirt <laughs> and an RAA hat with a brim. He was very interested to know exactly how far away the house was. And on our drive up there, he proceeded to count out loud every block from campus to the house. It was about 80 blocks. <laughs> This insatiable curiosity of Nathaniel's, he would sometimes carry to great extremes. But what is special and what separated him is that he wasn't content to have this curiosity be idle. He used it to affect change in the real world. A small example is Nathaniel's career with the New York Times. No, he was not hired by them. But that didn't stop him from contributing. We got the New York Times daily at our house. And while most of us thought it was a pretty good publication, Nathaniel wanted to make it better. He would write frequently. And soon, his published letters to the editor, ending with the byline, Nathaniel Gerhardt, Kensington, California, coated the surfaces in our kitchen. In Nathaniel's room, the walls were covered with the things he loved photographs of his family, his friends, his Frisbee teammates, his favorite birds. And he also had several of a small boy from Peru. This boy's name was Renzo, and Renzo's family had asked Nathaniel to be the boy's godfather. He took this role very seriously and could often be heard on the phone with Peru, speaking in his fluent Spanish with his godson. I think this illustrates one of Nathaniel's best traits, which was his real ability to engage with people in a meaningful way. Whether he was living among them for months or years, he could connect with people from vastly different backgrounds than himself and become part of their family and make them feel like part of his family. There have been several memorial services for Nathaniel Somehow that feels appropriate because the realization of his loss is hitting many of us in waves. It takes a long time to sink in, and in a way it keeps getting sadder and sadder. 
But something else I've found is that we're also experiencing waves of inspiration. After his memorial in New York, one of his friends told me that thinking about Nathaniel's love of birding, he'd gone out and purchased binoculars and went out birding for the first time and found a great deal of joy in that. Several of us hadn't played frisbee for years, but after the New York Memorial, a bunch of us, friends and family, gathered and played in park near where he grew up, and we could feel his presence. The name Nathaniel means gift from God. Whether it's his curiosity, his compassion, his open way with people, or his infectious joy, each of us can look at Nathaniel's gifts and ask, what are some aspects of Nathaniel's life that I can incorporate into my own? I think it would be tough to find a better role model. I can only believe that some of the sadness and pain of Nathaniel's passing will fade and the ways he inspires us will continue to grow. I met Nathaniel <clears throat> when he moved into a house I live in, the McGee house, in early 2003 on his return from New York. I remember the interview with Nathaniel clearly sitting in the room, which was about to be his, drinking tea. And I remember thinking how thoughtful he was. So I know Nathaniel as, as the two previous people. Um, not through school, not through work, but simply by living together. And in that way, I didn't just get to see his quirks, like his orange juice glass, which was nearly big enough to fit the entire pitcher of orange juice in it, <laughs> or the fact that he drank pickle juice before every ultimate game. <laughs> but I got to live life on a level with some of the intimacies of being family. Pretty soon after he moved in, it became apparent that what, what had initially seemed to be thoughtfulness was actually more of a deep awareness, both of himself and of others. Nathaniel saw people clearly, not judgmentally, not critically, but clearly. And he saw the relationships between people clearly. I can remember countless times when we would be in the kitchen at home discussing how to bring up a certain issue at the next house meeting in a way that would be best for everybody involved, and, or ranting about how the landlord, as he put it, talked to a particular brand of shit. <laughs> I loved his terms for things, and, and this is part of his love for languages as well. He called himself a meat avoider. He wasn't a vegetarian, but... <laughs> He was a meat avoider. <laughs> and he had a term that he called the male decay factor, which was very important for people living with him. Because whenever we were looking for a new housemate, he'd bring it up. Because according to this phenomenon, in a co-ed house, you all know this, in a co-ed house, the higher the ratio of men to women, the less likely a woman is to move into the house, <laughs> thus increasing over time the ratio of men to women. Of course, then, when three members of the five-person household moved out, all of them being women, he decided we should look for three new people. And then he proceeded to go to Indonesia for half of the time that we had to search for people. <laughs> It was the self-awareness, though, I think that was most apparent to me and, and very impressive. He was aware of himself, his tendencies, his boundaries, and he was always playing with them. And I use playing purposefully because his introspection, while, as with all of us, is sometimes serious, it lacked that self-help, guilt, weight sort of thing. And more often it came out playfully. So he had one of those costume parties that was referred to once, and he and I seemed to go to a lot of them together. And, and I could 
I wish I could remember his term for the party, but he wanted a party where people would come showing a part of themselves that they weren't used to showing to other people. And rather than talk a whole lot about that, I'll just let you know that he wasn't dressed in his Berkeley boy outdoor fleece covered Nathaniel. <laughs> and that was basically him. You know, I saw him as always wondering what his definition of himself could include. So when one of our housemates was leaving the Bay Area and had a show some skin party, we decided to go and show some skin. We didn't wear shirts, but we decided that we were going to cover our skin with body paint instead. So we spent a couple of hours preparing ourselves. I became a yin-yang. He became a brick wall. And by the end of the evening, somebody had put graffiti on his brick wall. And <laughs> We had walked down through the streets of the mission, and people had, had come up and started singing Brick House as they <laughs> passed him. Um, in preparing this, I, I lament the fact that I'm not a better storyteller, that they don't come as quickly as they could for me. Um, there are so many of them to tell. But the value I saw in our relationship was, was much more than having stories to tell. So many even liberated men have a uh, hard time having relationships that are beyond doing activities, going out for a drink, talking politics. And I really value that Nathaniel and I had a friendship that existed at that deeper level. We had fun. We talked openly. We had man dates where we talked about man dates. <laughs> and I'm, I'm so happy that I had that in my life, the influences of his friendship. Are, are indescribable. I miss him greatly. Hi, I'm Ryan, and this is my, my friend Rebecca, who's agreed to come join us. So I thank her for that. Um, I just I love music, so I thought I'd contribute by, by singing. Um, I liked this song because it was happy and it involved flying, so I thought that would be appropriate. Some bright morning when this life is o'er, I'll fly away to a home on God's celestial shore. I'll fly away. The next three speakers are friends from uh, Society and Environment, uh, the Division of uh, Environmental Science Policy and Management that, uh, that uh, Nathaniel was a student in. Jason Delborn, a friend and a colleague uh, who is now at, uh, doing a postdoc at the University of Wisconsin. Catherine Corson, who is a friend and a colleague from uh, the very first years it, that Nathaniel was at Society and Environment and Mike Dwyer, a friend and uh, a lab mate. He's formerly an ERG, but we've brought him into society and environment to, to work with us. So, thanks. 
and then we'll have another set of photo memories uh, following that. I first met Nathaniel uh, as his GSI, her TA, which kind of makes me smile because I know that I learned at least as much from him as he did from me. We became friends, and oddly enough, I never had the experience of throwing a frisbee with him or going birding with him. Uh, what I did see, though, and what I want to share with you today that many of you may not have seen um, was his wonderful ability to connect with children. He came out to visit me and my family uh, in Pleasant Hill many times uh, as Pleasant Hill co-housing. He just called it the commune. Um, my, daughter, my daughters, Olivia, who was four, and Ramona, who was one at the time, adored him. And I know that he adored them, too. He had the right kind of energy, a willingness to laugh and play and act silly that brought him into their world. I know Olivia actually had a crush on him for quite a while. Even after we moved to Madison, she would look at um, magazines and pictures of male models and say, Daddy, is that Nathaniel? <laughs> <laughs> but his good looks weren't, weren't what made him special to my family, of course. <laughs> he was, quite simply, the best little boy story teller we have ever heard. Part of my daughter's bedtime routine is that whoever's putting them to bed doesn't just read a story, but has to tell them a story from their own childhood. And whenever we'd have dinner guests over, we'd ask them to do that part. And Nathaniel took it very seriously, um, not as a burden, but as a real opportunity. Um, I recently learned from talking to Leslie, uh, Nathaniel's sister, that their father was a master storyteller. Um, and certainly, Nathaniel also had that skill. According to Leslie, one of his favorite themes was unexpected kindness from strangers. OK, back to bedtime for Olivia and Ramona. So Nathaniel had to tell stories that weren't too scary or too violent or too mature, but still totally engrossing. This is not easy. I know I can't capture his dramatic style, but I just have to share the outlines of two of his little boy stories. Story number one, the savage. When Nathaniel was little, his family was camping on a deserted island near Egypt. Walking near the beach one evening, they saw a lone figure, limping and practically naked, walking through the shallow waves. The family dispatched a friend who was along with them, who happened to be a long distance runner, to intercept this man as he walked the wrong way around the island. Nathaniel's father spent the next several hours telling the family, uh, inventing campfire stories about the savage, why he came there, what he was doing. When Nathaniel awoke the next morning, the savage was safely in a sleeping bag <laughs> at their campsite. In reality, this was a Greek tourist who accidentally got left by his hotel's day trip boat. <laughs> and the Gerhards brought him to safety. <laughs> Story number two, stuck in the mud. When the Gerharts were living in Africa, they took a trip through uh, the cloud forest in a large jeep. It had recently rained, and the going was tough. At one point, the jeep got stuck in the muddy road. The mud was up to the axles. The wheels were spinning. They pushed, and they pulled. They rocked, but to no avail. They were stuck in the middle of the forest, miles from anywhere, with no one around. No one that they saw, <laughs> anyway. After sitting in the car for over an hour, Nathaniel began to see faces peering out of the forest. Thirty or so men stepped out from the landscape and eventually pushed the Gerhards free. Olivia and Ramona were riveted. <laughs> Tanya and I were riveted. <laughs> These were wonderful stories of adventure, of kindness, of the power of nature, of the beauty of the unknown, of the thrill of living life off the beaten path. I'm thankful that my children had a chance to know and love him. I'm thankful to have gotten a glimpse of the experiences that made him the special man that he was. In our, in our house, he will always be the king of the little boy stories.
hard to go after that. <laughs> um, I don't remember meeting Nathaniel. In my memory of graduate school, he's just always there. He and I bonded immediately our first year at Berkeley. We both came to social sciences from biology. We had similar research interests. We worked with the same advisors, took the same classes. And then later in life, we both struggled to balance our overseas research with our long distance relationships and the desire to be in Berkeley. When we started in ESPM way back in 2001, we all thought Nathaniel was a nice, innocent guy. We soon discovered he knew how to have a good time. Many of us remember the surprise when he showed up at the first ESPM graduate student party in a black leather miniskirt. <laughs> I wasn't sure how much to say about this, but as the speakers before me have said, obviously this happened a few times. <laughs> His taste was questionable sometimes. There was also the car bomb party, which some people also may remember where he forced everyone to chug shots of Bailey's dropped in Guinness. These are two drinks that really should not be mixed. <laughs> he also used to drag me to the pizza place on Shattuck. I don't know how many people know it, but it's really not good pizza. <laughs> <laughs> he used to say it reminded him of New York. <laughs> and as I thought about what to say today, I tried to find <laughs> moments like this that we could reminisce about. But I just kept coming back to the fact that he was just a mainstay of my life, even when he wasn't here. My life was always brighter when he was around. I used to tell him this, and he would tell me that I needed to get a life. <laughs> <laughs> we had a wonderful, sarcastic relationship that I cherished. And many of our colleagues may remember our constant banter, probably annoying. And even though it's been several years since he was really here permanently, I look for him every time I go into 44 Giannini, the Society and Environment Lounge still. He was just always there, reading the New York Times online, procrastinating on whatever assignment we had that week. It wasn't until I left Berkeley proper, came back, but um, when we left to go do our research and, and pursue our long distance relationships, et cetera, that our friendship really solidified. So many of us in our cohort get used to maintaining our relationships through random dinners every couple of years. And a lot of times our friendships fade in that process. But somehow Nathaniel and I managed to get closer, meeting every few months in Berkeley as he came through or in Washington. He came to my wedding in Ithaca. He even tried to visit Desmond and I in Canada. Although I think that had more to do with the great gray owls that were appearing in the Gatineau Hills that year than us. <laughs> As anyone who knew Nathaniel is aware, he traveled great distances to keep in touch with his friends. Granted, he almost always called from the airport or train station at the last minute, asking for a place to stay that night. I had to laugh as I went through my old emails from him. I kept coming across ones that said something like, hi, I'm arriving from Jakarta tomorrow. A ride from the airport would be great. <laughs> I see a lot of people got that email. <laughs> um, the last time I saw Nathaniel was one of these times last December in Berkeley. He'd come through for a few days, again, wanting a place to stay. It was the end of the semester. I had 50 exams to grade, a dissertation chapter to finish, and a job interview to prepare for. So I told him I only had a couple hours around dinner time. Two other friends were staying with me, so I said he couldn't stay. We just talked for a couple hours over a rushed meal. Just like I don't remember meeting him, I don't remember saying goodbye that night. I just remember promising that the next time we'd spend more time hanging out wherever, wherever that might be. One of the things that struck me as I watched the New York service and looked through the photographs on the Flickr site was how unbelievably good he was at balancing his life, especially at prioritizing his friendships and family while simultaneously excelling in his career and traveling the world. He was the friend who always made it to important events. He was the one you could always count on when you needed support. Even from across the world, he managed to give us a sense of being right next door. 
It's been both wonderful and humbling to see so many windows into his life and to realize that I knew just one. There's so many things about him that I wish I could ask him now. After his death, I spent many hours wishing that I'd taken more time to ask him these things, to tell him what he'd meant to me, although he'd probably just tell me to get a life, <laughs> and wishing that, that I'd just taken more time in December. And as I worked through my sadness, I decided that the only thing I could really do was to follow his lead and try to prioritize the people that I love, learn more about them, and be there for them in the way that he always was for me. It's, <clears throat> it's really wonderful to be here with you all and to, to follow some of the wonderful things that have been said. Um, I'm going to, my talk is going to have a little bit of a different focus, but it's going to inevitably come back to a lot of the same themes that have come up already. Um, Nathaniel and I first met in the mid nineties, uh, when we played ultimate Frisbee against one another, um, playing college ultimate at the Haverford Invitational Tournament in, uh, in the spring of 96, I think it was. Um, and it's really, it was, we, ha we played a handful of times that, e that spring and the following spring. Um, and it was amazing that even though we were on opposing teams, I managed to know his name um, very, very quickly. And this was partly because he was a captain and he was in the middle of everything. And you would hear his name on the field a lot. And we knew when you play ultimate, you line up seven across. And it was always, we, were, we would always grumble to each other who had to cover Nat um, <laughs> when we lined up across from him. <laughs> Be, and if any, you know, I, I know there are people who, here who have played with him. And if you, were on his, if you were not on his team, it was frustrating in some of the worst ways because he wouldn't let you get away with the grumbling, sort of begrudging somebody being a good player but not being a good sport. And that was what made it initially frustrating and to, to play against him because you couldn't, you couldn't just say, oh, you know, but he's not a good guy too. Um, when we eventually met here, um, I think it was at least, at least half a decade later and maybe a little bit more, we recognized each other immediately. Um, and we, uh, we built an additional bond through our shared focus um, to, when, to do research in Southeast Asia where we, where we both committed ourselves to not just study and try to understand the politics of natural resource development that was happening in our respective field sites, but to really get involved and to use our abilities and connections in order to try to change what was going on in the places that we were working. Um, my research is in Laos, and if there's anything that I've learned in the field, it's that you have to build political solidarity, not just in the meetings and through the reports, but through, unfortunately for me, not the Frisbee games, but through the off the field activities. And I wanna suggest that Ultimate and Frisbee in particular played a very big and important role for that. And so I wanna talk a little bit about Ultimate and the way that I think it intersected with Nat's very real focus on combining the work and the play into life so that, so that those two things didn't really separate. Um, Ultimate creates a special bond among the people who play, um, a bond that when they meet each other in the larger arena of everyday life, provides an unusually rich foundation upon which to move forward with other activities. Um, it's not usually framed in these terms, but I think of this foundation as the game's politics. Um, by, by design, Ultimate has no referees. You settle your own disagreements and disputes about rule violations on the field using a system of rules that's designed to preclude the more Hobbesian approach to settling disagreements. Um, in this regard, Ultimate is both more like real life than other sports and more perfect than real life. Its system for conflict resolution covers all the possibilities and permutations. 
And this adds a, both a level of responsibility that's missing from refereed sports where you can appeal to a higher decision making authority, but it also adds a level of possibility that's all too often sadly missing from everyday life. And while this is what attracts some people to the game, more importantly, it helps ultimate players develop into what I would just simply call political citizens. Um, so just to put it in, in concrete terms, what, what I want to say is that when Nathaniel took Frisbees around the world and taught people to play, and I know he did this religiously, we heard it um, from his friends in, in the New York Memorial. Um, he did it in a way that it invokes the dedication, I think, of a political organizer rather than a sports enthusiast. Um, and when he did this, I think he knew exactly what he was doing. Um, it wasn't about having fun in order to paper over your differences, but about using the game and its practice of communication, respect, and total responsibility, and even its building of unity through hardship, as you know if you've played. That he was using that to build connections among people and mixing work and play into life, and that's what I'll remember the most. Thank you. Someday, maybe, baby, you might be feeling low down. Hold up your hand, count to three. I will meet you, I will meet you downtown. You can always. You can always come to me I won't be busy And even if I am I'll kiss your tears away Like you have done for me mm. I try to help you Try to help you out of any jam You can always You can always come to me We'll take a little walk Somewhere by the trees and water We'll never talk about how good things can be mm. Even if you're far away Honey, just close your eyes And you can always You can always Come to me mm -hmm. I'll be with you Walking through an ancient land Even when it's hard, we're exactly where we're supposed to be. Mm. And I want you, I want you to understand. You can always, you can always come to me. Mm -hmm. You can always. You can always come to me Baby, you can always You can always come to me Get it, 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 get it You can always come to me Anytime, not Even if you're far Baby, you can always, always 
has come to me mm-hmm, You can always Ah, you can always come to me So many people today have spoken so eloquently and from their hearts about Nathaniel. I'm always going to remember that look he had in his eyes when he wasn't smiling so big you couldn't imagine that it would fit on his face. He always had this kind of gleam and amused look. And in class, or in my office, I always thought it was he was enjoying some ironic conversation or I- idea that we were having. Now I realize he was probably thinking of some really cool bird that he had just seen. Or the time we met at Mike's house to read a play together. I had a historical play about the occupation and mapping of Ireland by the British called Translations. And another student, Juliet, suggested that we perform it or read it for ourselves. This was very odd. (laughs) Graduate students I had asked before never really wanted to do that sort of thing, but Nathaniel got behind it. (laughs) So uh, we decided to uh, pick straws for the parts because the women's parts were less desirable. (laughs) And as luck would have it, Nathaniel played one of the women. I look back at some of the early letters that I wrote for Nathaniel and saw that in a very early one I talked about him as having 
and understated brilliance. He came into our program, as do many students with a background in biology. His was from Williams College. His advisor there, Kai Lee, who's now with the Packard Foundation, uh, called me the other day. He wanted to be here, but had to be out of, out of town. And, uh, but he was remembering the letter that he wrote when Nathaniel applied for graduate school here. And in that letter, he mentioned that um, the, the, and in his last year, that his usually excellent grades had slipped a little bit because he is so busy developing a composting program for the entire campus. Um, and as a practical group in society and environment, we recognized this as a positive sort of civic engagement, and we accepted him. One of the reasons that I was excited about working with Nathaniel was that he had had three years' experience working in Peruvian rainforests, doing what he seemed to do best in life, bringing people of disparate interests and social positions together over common loves, and in this case, that was those rainforest areas. People with very different ideas about how those forests should be preserved or used or protected or accessed. And the very first day of his first semester, he came into my office and I told him how forward I was looking to working with him and helping him to learn more about political ecology as he worked in Peru. And he looked right at me with that great big smile and he said, Oh, well, I've been thinking about it, and I decided that it would be a real missed opportunity if I didn't take advantage of your experience in Southeast Asia, in Indonesia. I was floored. But what could I say? It was very hard to talk Nathaniel out of anything. And in fact, that was the beginning of a, of a set of discussions and decisions that eventually led Nathaniel to decide to go to East Kalimantan in Indonesian Borneo after reluctantly abandoning his plans to go to West Papua where there was too much violence and at that time it was too difficult to get government permission. The first semester Nathaniel was here, he wrote the proposal to NSF that gained him three years of graduate student funding. He also earned a FLAS, a foreign language area scholarship to study Indonesian, a Sumitro travel grant to, to study Indonesian in Java, an NSF doctoral dissertation improvement grant, and a Fulbright Hayes Fellowship. He was so successful at writing grants that he had to turn some of them down. We've talked a lot about the personal side of Nathaniel, but I think it would be good in this gathering to um, talk a little about his academic self, what his goals were. His, his, his career goal was to find conservation and development solutions for what he called the middle ground. Those areas of tropical forest, usually secondary forest in various degrees of maturity or resurgence or decline that were neither heavily degraded nor pristine. Those are the kind of areas, as you probably know, that, that tend to draw most of the international funding as well as the attention of mainstream, mainstream conservationists and the press. And this bias, of course, tends to ignore those areas of forest where most ecosystem functions are still intact, despite in some case, or in some cases because of their human populations. Those inhabited areas produce much more complicated problems as well for those who seek to balance economic benefits and human rights with conservation as Nathaniel was dedicated to trying to do. And Nathaniel believed, in fact, that the solutions for all tropical forest areas must begin with efforts to understand the human communities that depend on them, rather than involving local people as an afterthought to top-down protections. Of course, this is a perspective that came out of Nathaniel's long experience in Peru and resonated with the kind of political ecology training that he sought out here in Berkeley. But I have to say, the most amazing thing to me was that he taught forest villagers in the middle of Borneo to play ultimate frisbee. <laughs> you may or may not know that Joseph Conrad didn't only write about Africa. He also wrote about Brau and Tanjung Radeb, the city that leads 
to the areas where Nathaniel did his field work, and I'm sure he never would have imagined that for that place. We've lost someone, a wonderful person, a wonderful man, uh, who was very precious and had incredible promise. For me, his connections to Indonesia, to Kalimantan, to political ecology, to forests, and to some of my favorite people across campus and in the world have made this loss much more profound. I have to say, quite honestly, I had already begun to think of, of Nathaniel as a colleague and not as a student. And I thank all of you for coming and sharing your memories of him today. We have one more award for Nathaniel, and I'm wondering if Leslie could please join me here in the front. Um, Nathaniel had not yet begun to write his dissertation, but, but he had completed many steps towards its, towards its uh, completion. And, and he had passed his oral exams, he had written a viable proposal, he had won a, a great deal of financial support for his field work and done about 80 to 90 percent of that field work. And so to recognize all that he accomplished, the university has awarded him the degree of candidate in philosophy. At our graduation ceremonies in May, we'll follow our usual procedures, and Nathaniel will be granted the degree. Today, we'd like to anticipate that and present this mock degree, which you can all see here, and it's great beauty, to his sister Leslie, and, and when the university actually um, uh, makes up the real degree, we'll send it to your, your mom in, in New York. Now, as you know, when, when we award the PhD here, the tradition is for the committee chair to hood the, the new PhD, to actually put their hood over their head and to read uh, the title of their successful dissertation. And um, because Nathaniel hasn't yet written that dissertation, I can't actually tell you the title, but I will give you the title of his most recent proposal, and that is Decentralizing Forest Management Consequences for Local Democracy in Brau Regency, East, East Kalimantan. So what we're going to do now, thank you so much, Thank you, Nancy. Nancy. Congratulations. Oh, you. He was a wonderful student. We're going to watch one last clip. It's a video clip. It's a couple of short videos in which we can hear Nathaniel being Nathaniel. And uh, following the video, um, the, the, waiter and wa the waiters will be passing around um, alcoholic and non-alcoholic beverages. I'd like to ask you all to stay in place. Please take a beverage so that we can have a communal toast together to send Nathaniel's memory. Well, his memory will never leave us, but just to raise a glass together. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Ernesto. No. Did you 
Did you hear what the uh, mother Hawaiian said to her kid when he asked if he could run up to the volcano? No. Uh-uh. Tell us what you saw today. We saw uh, fur seals in the water. And we got under the water with them and they had their big eyes and they were going... And we swam with them. And then they would shoot by you. And like twist all around in the water. Uh huh. And then um, I went to the boat and the boat driver said, They see him, they're seeing a manta ray over there. So then I realized where everyone else was and I swam up and Jim and Ed Nessa were just sitting there and I thought, Oh, they've lost it. And then they found it again. And so I was kind of swimming after them, trying to figure out what was going on. And uh, I landed down with myself. I was like, what's going on? Where's the pool? She's like, there's a manta right now. I was like, well, I haven't seen it yet. She's like, hurry up, it's up there. <laughs> so I finally realized you have to actually swim after it. <laughs> you have to chase it? But then it was like a race, and you basically you just chased it until you ran out of energy. But it was huge. It was and that won the race. <laughs> It was massive. Ten feet. At least ten feet, ten probably foot fifteen. Wingspan. Did you see uh, it? Left leg. <laughs> we thought it was two manta rays because we'd see one tip go up and then ten meters away there'd be another tip, but it was right. different tips of the same ray. Did you see it? Yeah. Down the side. I was like, let's go. Nathaniel, tell us what you thought about the baby sea lion. Very snappity. Extremely yeah, snootery. High snoot potential. Wait, you're too close. Okay. High snoot quotient. Could you, could you bring that in scientific terms? Stuff or snootery? I said the snooters or the snootery. Okay. Wait, that was the, that was the uh, occasion of my favorite hearts game of all time. Mom, went, Mom and I and someone else were playing Sue Brothers, and Mom, I was out of it, but Mom was within 20, two points of the lead, and Sue was in the lead, and in the same, in the final hand, I was able to give the Queen of Spades to Sue and the Jack of Diamonds to Mom. So that mom won. <laughs> that's amazing. That's my, that's my crowning achievement. After our toast, we'll, uh, we'd like to invite you all to stay for a, a small reception. We have, we'll have some, some food and some, some drink on the patio. And um, do we have Frisbees? We have Frisbees. So anybody who would like to throw a Frisbee in Nathaniel's honor, we have access to the faculty glade, which is on the other side of the faculty club. And um, uh, I'm sure you can throw them wherever you want. Maybe not in here. <laughs> but. Anyway, so someone should be passing around drinks. Very soon, so we can have our, our toast. Thank you all for coming today. We might need to ask the people in the aisles to help the people that are further in.
Are we ready? Shall we toast our friend? I want to thank Nathaniel once more for bringing a wide diversity of people together in his honor and through his inspiration to Nathaniel. <laughs>